Sure enough, comes through, the woman pulls this filled out the chief exec's bag. All the boys are cracking up. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Rugby Pass Offload with me, Christina Mahan. And today I'm joined by Ryan Wilson and Jamie Roberts. Welcome, guys. How are you guys, Christina? How are you? Ryan, good to see you, mate. How are, how are you both? Hello, everybody. I am wonderful. Well, before we get stuck into everything, I want to know, did either of you guys watch the McGregor fight over the weekend? What time was it on? Was it 5 a.m.? Ah, uh, see, I, I yeah. just can't do that. I got no interest in waking up middle of the night. I'm saving my sleep. I'm having a kid in three weeks, so there is no way I'm getting up at 5 a.m. Man, that would have been good training for you. You should have started then and then just Not trying interested. to get I'll train on the job, mate. Yeah, no, I'm the same. I didn't really know when it was going to be on, um, so, yeah, didn't really, didn't really fancy it. I think only the diehards would fancy staying up until 5 a.m. I just couldn't. Just, Did he win? No, he lost. Oh, he lost. <laughs> Shock. Oh, I think he got, he got uh, was it a technical knockout in the second round? There you go. I think I got yeah, that he right. got knocked out, basically. He got sparkled. I've seen the memes. That's about it. That's the how I knew class. he'd uh, lost. So my next question would be, if you had to pick a player that you've played alongside or against to make it in the UFC, who would it be and why? I'll go with you first, Ryan. I couldn't really think of too many people. Obviously, there's like I'm I'm going like the back row, back row slash a centre Jamie size would probably be like your perfect sort of UFC fight, wouldn't it? You look at like James Haskell. Is he still doing that, by the way, James Haskell? He he went to UFC, didn't he? So I mean, your back row is sort of your your go to position. Then you've got the props where you've got a little bit a little bit more weight behind them. And then the scrum halves are going lightweight. So yeah, the props would have passed them, mate. The props would, if they do one round, they'd be absolutely knackered and you just get them in a chokehold and they'd be done. I'd go, i agree with you, back row, uh, two players for me. Francois Lowe would be one, played with him at Bath, just kind of low set, tough, yeah. as, tough as anything. Um, and just <laughs> would just be there at the end, be there at the death, like just staring you in the face. He'd be proper, proper good UFC fighter. And the other one would probably be Ross Moriarty. I play with him at the Dragons now. Um, well, they call him Red Ross. Red, <laughs> Red Ross. He's yeah, just just tough, just tough. And again, would never, would never cave, would never give in. Yeah, Chris Fazar at Glasgow Warriors. I'm putting there, stocky little nuggety guy. Yeah. Just gets the red mist all the time at training, just wants to batter people, grit its teeth, and just get stuck in there. And you'd never get him in a hold, but too strong, too strong, <laughs> no, exactly. Too yeah, just constantly going at it. So, yeah, I'll put Gina Chris Fazzaro for me, but it'd be interesting I'm, to see. I'm, eh? I'm too much of a pussy, I think you'd be the same, Ryan, as well. I'd yeah, I, mate, I haven't got it in me. My shoulders wouldn't last two seconds in there. Yeah, I'm too gangly. You're very mouthy though, Ryan. Like you do well with that part. Like you do well with the press conferences and stuff. But then when it came, yeah, to well, that doesn't help when you're going to bring like, oh. bad. <laughs> that is very I'm true. Top, top way out of it. That's that's what I'd have to do. No, I wouldn't last two minutes. We've done all sorts of like preseason training with like you know they say send you to these judo things and stuff like that. Oh God, I can't stand them. We've done boxing before as well, down in Govan, which is in like a pretty dodgy place in Glasgow. Turned up this Rocky esque gym for preseason with this wee fellow who's like real nitty, and everyone had to get in the ring with him. And he like would just belt the shit out of you. So that was one of our preseasons. We ended up having two or three boys concussions, like knocked out DTH, Van der Merver. I think he got knocked out at one point. There's always the guy in the group as well, eh, Jamie, that's done a bit of boxing before. And they get in there and just start slamming it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, no, not for me. Well, we're only, I think it's 11 days away from the start of the Guinness Six Nations, not that I've been counting. Um, and before we dive into, I suppose, the big stories of the day, I have to ask you, Jamie, after all the hype I gave you last week, you sadly missed out on the Welsh selection. How are you feeling about being left out? Yeah, I'm like, disappointed, um, you know, as you, as you would be, you know, naturally. I, I feel I'm playing good rugby. I'm enjoying my rugby, but ultimately, you can only control what you can control, can't you? Um and you know, obviously, my my services aren't uh, aren't wanted by the national coach, and and that's the way it is. You know, they were wanted for a very long time, and uh, you know, <laughs> ultimately, I'm uh, I'm not. The services aren't wanted at the minute. So, look, I'm I'm happy in myself that I'm playing good rugby, and I'm enjoying my rugby. That's the most important thing for me. I guess selection is uh, is something that's out of your control. You know, there were reasons for it. 
and and you know such is life so like I'll, i'm a massive watch rugby fan i'll be supporting them uh you know more than ever even though i've missed out you know were you what, contacted what about me, christina by the way uh give me a second ryan it's not all we're about coming, you it's not all about you pal we're coming to you mate. whoa 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 just wait a second now <laughs> I, I'm actually just so happy that Ryan is really excited to be on the show. He's like, just ask me a question. He's like, I've actually done my research. Obviously, this week Sorry. he's done his research. Uh, Jamie, were you contacted and told the news, or how did you find out that you didn't make the squad? Uh, no, no. Like I, I found out when they announced the squad. Um, I had a brief chat with a gaffer. Um, you know, I won't have all the short conversation, but yeah, like it's it is what it is. I'll. Uh, as I said, I think when it comes to international rugby, you respect the coach's decision, certainly when you're in it. And when you get picked, it's uh, it's an amazing feeling. You've got to represent your country and done it many, many tournaments in the Six Nations. But you also have to have that that same level of respect when when you don't make it. Uh, and albeit that decision goes against you and in favour of someone else, that's, that's professional sport. And that's certainly representative sport. I think anyone who, who's played representative sport, you, you've got to have respect to the decision either way and uh, you know I have respect with uh, with Wayne's decision regarding myself do they call, do they let you know after it's been announced Jane or, or was he did he speak to you before no no I just spoke to him in the week um so yeah it's uh it is what it is and you know there's some some quality players have missed out and that's um you know that goes to show you know the strength and depth we we have in Wales and it's the same across a lot of the countries um you know certain certain players have missed out on selection and that's the way it should be. You know, there should be a, yeah, I think it's great for, for a country like Wales that, you know, you, you look at like someone like Reese Webb who misses out, you know, the guy's a British Lion um, and hasn't been picked. And, and that's great. You know, it's just very disappointing for someone like Reese, but um, great that we have that strength and depth to, to be able to leave out someone of his ability, you know. And Ryan, I suppose another incredible player that's missed out on selection for Scotland. How did you hear the news and um, how good are you? Are you smiling, Christina? <laughs> I'm smiling. Why, well. why are you smiling at that? Because your face just makes me want to smile, Ryan. That's all. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. If you want, yeah, I can well. write your the boss. Um, no, I think I think I'm I'm fully fucked now because I didn't even get a phone call to tell me I wasn't in it. So, so I must be really down the old pecking order. No, I don't know what happened, but is what it is. Like I I didn't expect to be in there because I've not been in there for well since the World Cup now. So I played all right. Did you watch the Edinburgh Derby match, Christina? You told me you were going to. Well, after the stick you gave me for saying that I watched your game and then you would, you didn't believe me, I was like, I'm not watching. watching it. Actually, I realised after you won, I was like, maybe I'm the reason why they keep losing because every time I watch your game, maybe you don't do that well. So potentially have I just got myself a bit of an out here? Yeah, probably. Oh, I wouldn't write, but yeah, listen, again, like like Jamie's saying, you know, there's plenty of good players out there now and it's it's all, all good for the, the nation that they've got a, a big big group of players to pick from. So good luck to them. You never know what can happen though, eh, Jamie? Injuries and all that stuff. Exactly, man. Exactly. As uh, very rarely do those squads get through tournaments without getting injuries, especially in, you know, spots like back row, man. Jesus, it's attritional. Uh, you know, I've seen from England already they've lost launch free they've lost Sam Underhill today um, and there'll be many more so um, stay in shape Ryan you've got a chance mate. oh don't worry mate I'm always in shape never, been say, doing, never say never doing my driveway this week to keep me fit so I'm all good man Love yeah this. I saw that you've got the kids you've broke the kids in as well haven't you oh yeah I had them on the wheelbarrows yeah homeschooling they are life lessons Christina you need to get the kids involved in it realise what hard graft is with the games being played unfortunately, behind closed doors. Do you think that the lack of fans will make it harder or easier for the players to raise their game? Do you know what? I think it takes away home advantage. And we've probably seen that in the last Six Nations, you know, how many teams could kind of get away. You know, Scotland beat Wales at an empty park of Scarlets. Now, I'm not, you know, discrediting that victory for Scotland. but it's Oh, really? Play, yeah, but playing, you know, if that is a sold-out Principality Stadium... It just gives, from a Welsh perspective, it gives you this this another gear. And, you know, it'd be similar for Scotland players playing at Murrayfield in front of the home crowd. Same for the English lads at Twickenham and Ireland um, at the Aviva as well. I just think it just lessens that home advantage, which I think we're probably going to see a more open Six Nations this tournament than ever because of that. You know, teams will know that going away from home is not as daunting. Ryan, do you think that that, like an empty stadium, does impact on playing at home? 
hundred percent. Yeah, it impacts the yeah everyone. I think it like people that go out there and, and say, oh, you know, I don't notice it, especially at the national level. If you know those guys getting their first cap, it might not impact them as much as some of the other players that have got some because when you're playing for your country, that's you know you really notice the change in the atmosphere and everything around these massive national stadiums. So some of these guys, I feel for the guys getting their first cap when there's no fans and no families able to go. You know, because it's such a special day for for a player um, to not have your family. I completely agree, man. It's it's really tough, isn't it? You know, your parents can't be there. Um, Certainly, people from your home club can't travel to the stadium to support you. Um, Everyone on your path, you know, when you win your first cap for your country, you know, your best mates are there supporting you. Exactly. And and you just don't have any of that. So hopefully those who have won their first caps over the last year or in this tournament um, coming ahead of us will play long enough to be able to experience sold out international stadiums as players. Yeah, too right. Oh, fingers crossed. Well, we've heard some pretty interesting stories about the state of the away dressing rooms over the years in rugby. So I want to know who has the worst facilities for visiting clubs in the Six Nations? So you know what? I'm going to take a start. There's Murrayfield. And I t- at Murrayfield, they put a big, massive column in the middle of the changing room. And am I, am I right, Ryan? They've done that on purpose. Even the stadium up, mate. Huh? It's keeping the stadium up, I think. It's probably keeping the stadium up, but I was told that Murrayfield, they put the away change room, there's a massive column right through the middle of it. Yeah. And actually, you know, when you're in the best change rooms, a nice big, they're open, you can see all the other players. But when you're in Murrayfield, it's quite a small dressing room anyway. Yeah. But all you see is people to your left and right, and then there's this massive column right in front of you. It's quite... <laughs> It's, da- it's not say daunting. It just divides up the room. Um, yeah, it's more. It's more know. like a club change room, isn't it? That's where I think Ed- that's Edinburgh's home change room. I think so. They get changed in there, but the the uh, yeah, our, our change room at Murrayfield's lovely. They've redone it recently as well. It's really really flash actually. But you don't yeah you don't go to many stadiums where you get that, especially at international level, and you you don't get yeah that. I think most. It, most international teams they have equal sort of facilities like Wales is unbelievable when you go down there they've got lovely big changing rooms and stuff like that so it's quite an old stadium though isn't it so uh, I think that may be the excuse <laughs> Jamie did you find that ever did, did you find that ever impacted on your preparation for the game when you walked into this like this changing room with a stupid pillar in the middle of it well obviously uh, not because he's never bloody lost there is he yeah it's I know until I, until I sat on the bench in 2017 and we lost then um the, I never lost when I started against Scotland. Um, anyway, besides the point. Wayne Pivak, listen <laughs> to me. <laughs> uh, besides the point. The no, it just it was just strange. It it was just kind of you kind of had to get into this small little huddle to the side of the pillar, um, and it was yeah. I, I think yeah. it's on purpose. I need to get to the bottom of that. Yeah, you will have to get the bottom of that. I'd say. Look, um, I don't think at international, you don't get a bad change room. I don't think. Yeah, I agree. I agree. You, you might be right with Scotland stuff, but the pretty cool one was when we, um, when you play at Stadio Olimpico and they leave the footballers' names above the thing and you've got Francesco Totti's name above his space. That's pretty cool. That's one yeah, that the boys yeah. like. Did you ever play at Stadio Flaminio? Uh, I don't think I did, no. Okay, I think that was the last game there. The last tournament they played there was 2010, I think. It might have been 11. Or maybe 09, actually. 9 or 11, we played away in Italy. And, um, yeah, Sadio Flaminio. Like, I remember this brilliant time when um, we had a shocking first half up there. I think we were losing half-time. We were awful. Um, and we've come in, and Andy Powell has just lost his head with the lads. And it's quite a small changing room. And next to the changing room is the shower. Um, but unbeknown to Pauli, the shower room is quite small, but it only has one way in and out. So he's kind of lost his head with all the lads. Like it's quite a small changing room. And he's like whacked his hand on the bench, proper lost his head, and gone to leave the room. But instead of leaving the room, he's left into the shower room. <laughs> he's left into the shower room, right? And so he's lingered there for about five seconds. Everyone's like a bit awkward. And then he's had to walk back out. Like he, he hasn't had a natural exit from the room. He's walked straight into a blind ended shower room. I remember that quite clearly, like in a very small Stadio Flaminio dressing room. It was proper old school. 
Well, we're incredibly honored to have the ex-Scottish international and honorary Frenchman Johnny Beattie alongside us to preview France's chances for the upcoming Six Nations. Thank you for joining us, Johnny. Pleasure. Hi, guys. Johnny, you're an incredibly distinguished ex-Scottish international with 38 caps for your country, but you've been living and playing in France now for the last eight years. So we'd love to hear your thoughts on France's hopes to Six Nations, especially after a great display last year. Is there going to be a lot of pressure on the squad from the public and the media uh, for them to perform this season? Um, not particularly a lot of pressure, I wouldn't say. I think they've been perennial underachievers for nigh on 10 years. The last time they achieved anything was probably 2010 and they've been kind of sleeping giants for, for a decade. So um, pressure, no, because they've been so poor for so long, but they've just inspired people and given a rugby public a massive amount of hope after the way they performed in 2020. They lost two games, one against Scotland at Murrayfield and one against Twickenham in a final with essentially a B team. So look, completely changed team um, for a national team sport. The South of France has gone absolutely crazy for them and the way they're playing. So I wouldn't say as much media pressure, just a load of hope. Everyone's really excited to see a French national team that is back playing at a decent level. Awesome. Well, last week we got Mike and Jamie to pick their top th three game changers from their respective countries. So for you, picking for your adopted country, which three French players are the ones that are going to hold the keys to the success of this Six Nations? So your obvious one is my old mate Antoine Dupont, a guy that I played with at Cast. Um, freakish acceleration, can step off both feet, offend. He's ridiculously strong as well for a little bloke. Um, and he's just an outstanding week in, week out for Toulouse. Um, number two or three together, I don't know which one's going to start, depending on which one Fabian goes for. But you've got Damian Peno, who didn't play in 2020, who, again, huge athlete, six foot four, um, can run a ball in from absolutely anywhere. Um, ridiculous sidestep, great finisher. And Teddy Toma, who's at Racing 92, um, a teammate of Zebo, who, again, is just freakish, like a ridiculous athlete. But they're blessed with so much talent in that position. And then the extra one in that position, another back three, so it's three back three and Antoine Dupont would be Gabin Villiers, somebody that not many people know that much about. He's playing with Rouen and Federal one four years ago and then he's on the seventh circuit, but he um, got a bit of game time last year in the Six Nations and in the Autumn Nations Cup, a guy that ridiculous speed. And also if anybody gets into his own attack area, if he gets to the edge and attack against them, he's the, he's the top turnover maker for Toulon in, in, the, in their team. So ridiculous over ball and a threat from anywhere over the pitch. Really, really good talent. Johnny, that's players who are fit, right? How much will yeah. they miss Virumi Vakitawa? Because for me, he's, he's one of the best players in World Rugby at the minute. And, you know, we don't know if he's going to be out injured for the whole tournament. But how big a loss is he for France? Well, he's pretty much their go-to. Like, he's their biggest threat. Like, I've talked about finishers, people that can destroy teams um, because they're well-organized now. That's the thing. But Vakatawa is the one person that gave him that X factor in midfield, go forward, but also you never knew what he was going to do. And again, simple starter plays we've seen over and over with Finn at Racing and the French team. It's basically scrum time, nine, one miss pass to 13, have a go. Like, it's ridiculous, but that's as simple as the game plan gets because he's that good. So... Mate, he's a big mess for the tournament and for the French team. Um, but we've talked before, there's loads of people that now can come in and perform at a decent level. We saw Jonathan Dante come in before. He's not even made the squad this side. There's, there's just so much talent in, in the back three and in the centre. So he's a huge loss. But I think the way this team is organised now, and actually they play some proper rugby, so they won't miss him as much as they would have maybe two, three seasons ago, is my well, understanding. That's what I was going to say, John. Is they definitely, they've definitely got better defensively as well, and they've made a massive focus there, haven't they? With Sean Edwards stepping in. Is Vakatao the defender that he wants in there? Probably not, because he's, like you said, he's an all out attacking player. He's probably not as good defensively, is he? So, like, if they carry on wanting to push their defensive side of things, um, it'll probably do them good getting someone else in there, a bit of game time, see how they go, I reckon. Yeah, potentially. I think the difference with France has just been look, they've got Fabian Galtier, who is the best attack coach I ever worked with. Sean Edwards, Jamie, you know, inside out, he's notoriously the best defense coach probably in world rugby over the past 10 years. And they've just, they've had a complete shift in attitude. So before where you played against France, you thought, right, lazy, you might catch them napping. Now both an attack and defense multi-phase, there's nowhere to go. They work hard off the ball. Um, they work hard on the scientific stuff. They've got Thibaut Giroud, who you know what, Brian from um, yes. Glasgow, he's in our head of performance. Like, so they're properly organized. And the French team have never had that before. They've never had decent coaches, decent S&C, and help to perform and perform at the top level. Um, of world rugby so look Vakatawa is a loss but they've got coaches now that it doesn't really matter who they slip in you look how they performed in that final 
they, they threw a B team effectively of people that hadn't played at all against England at Twickenham and they could have won the game because they're actually organized. They do all the bits, the nuts and bolts that all international teams do. And then they've got that X factor, even with B team kids. So it's an exciting time. Um, and it's been a long time coming because it's been frustrating for French rugby and for the French rugby public watching them. They've been poor for so long, but ultimately now for world rugby and for the Six Nations, you've got a French team that is here. So it's exciting. Mate, you're, spot on. you're spot on, man. I, they are a sleeping giant. Like, I think anyone Ridiculous. who's played rugby have been happy, certainly during my time playing with Wales, just happy that France never fully achieved their potential because they're freakish. I mean, the strength and depth now is, is frightening. But they have the ability in all facets of the game. You're spot on. And the thing is, like, you'd have seen as well playing at Racing, Jamie, the amount of French kids that you would have played with and you thought, if that guy was Welsh or he was Scottish, he'd probably be capped. But because they're so bottlenecked by foreign players or by, by, by layers of French players, they never get a shot. Whereas now that's been blown open. All the sort of middle road foreigners, people like me have left or retired. There's been a sort of emphasis on young Gif players and yeah. they're just churning them out. Like two years of under 20s world champs and they're all now getting game time, which they haven't had in key positions as well. Like you didn't get, after Nico Mass, there wasn't a French tight head. And now you're seeing two or three or four blokes now in the top 14 regular game time. They're churning players out. Tens, they didn't have that many decent players for a long time. Now you've got Jalibert and Tamak and Carbonell. Like, so it's just depth. There's a depth chart that's coming along um, and they're properly organized at top level, which is exciting for everyone, but obviously more difficult to play against them because they're a proper team. Well, you were lucky enough to play under the genius of Fabian. Is it Galti? I am Galtier. so Galtier. Galtier. Galtier, so useless yep. I'm so useless and usually I have time to prep it but anyway um uh, so he, at Mon Montpellier but first of all how good a coach and motivator is he um he's 100% the best technical coach I ever worked with the best attack coach by an absolute mile um the way he could break down a game um paint a picture of how he wanted you to play I 100% played my best rugby under him at Montpellier for those two years um and yeah, he's done a wonderful job with the French team in terms of attack and what they do um, and really tying things up. Like obviously, it's the side that everyone talks about, the sort of crazy side of, of what goes on on a personal level. But the overriding feeling for me was, look, the best attack coach that I work with, um, but then there's the but. And th there's always going to be the but. Um, but, you know, just trem a tremendous coach, really insightful, tremendous rugby IQ, um, really smart, intelligent bloke. So... Uh, played the, the best rugby that I managed to get was, was under him, definitely. And it was Mario Desmo was the assistant coach as well at Montpellier. Well, I suppose you can have a guess at what my next question is going to be, but I do want to know if you have any stories on how crazy and erratic he was at times. There's a few, like we had guys like Ivan Watram, like it was essential bullying with, with, with some boys, which a guy Ivan Watram is that ultimately ended up suffering with anxiety because he was getting treated so badly. So like as a senior player group, we had to go and speak to Fabian and say, look, you're going to have to stop because he would rock up in his car, he'd get stomach pains and he wouldn't be able to get out of the car because he was so scared of coming into the building and having to deal with the coaching group. So those guys like that, he was bad with Ivan. He used to like, and defensively, he'd like pull people into place by their ears, like stand there, you fat pig. Like I didn't tell you, not two meters apart, one meter apart and like drag people into place. Um, but it was also old, old school and different levels. Then it came to like, do you remember Lucas Amorosino, the Argentinian fullback? Yeah. Um, who knocked Scotland at the World Cup in 2011. Um, really nice bloke, actually. Stuff like the president, who was Moed Altrad, signed him in pre-season. Like, it's extended his contract for three seasons. He signed on the line. And then Fabian said, look, I, I haven't been part of these discussions. But Fabian loved him. It was like a no-brainer. But because he hadn't been part of the discussion, he was like, no, nah, I don't want him. You have to fire him. So like he signed a three-year contract. Three weeks later, the president had to pay him out three, three years' money and send him on his way because Fabian had disagreed. Like There was just a sort of continual stream of trying to get his own way, strong personality, stubborn, um, but at the same time, a really wonderful coach. So a strange balance um, as a bloke. But look, we, we even said back then, you know, obviously it's difficult on a day-to-day -day in a club in terms of an environment. Like You guys know what it's like, what you're trying to build. Year to year, it's hard graft, but he was so talented and so switched on. Back then, we were like, he'd be absolutely amazing as a national team coach because you'd dip in, you'd be with him for four or five weeks, you'd get the rugby bit, and then you'd leave. And I think that's where he's now found his balance. He, he doesn't have to work with people that he can't tolerate. He's working with the high end, the absolute cream of the crop, which is where he needs to be, and he's found his place. Um, he's been working hard to find it for, you know, for a few years, but he's there and he's doing a good job.
He sounds like a very, very scary man. But um, <laughs> well, moving on, I suppose you obviously played alongside Ryan for Scotland and Glasgow. So I would like to know what memories you have of a young Ryan coming into the domestic and the national squads. So I think Ryan arrived in 2010. I left in 2012. Um, and straight off the bat, just cheeky, just winding people up, but in a good way. Like somebody you want around a squad and that you can lift people up when things aren't going well. Um, and just fun, naughty. Um, no, yeah, you like that. It would be naughty would be the word that I would use to describe, right? Very I think people naughty. that know him would, um, would agree. Um, I remember as well, we'd like a team social. It must have been your first year. Team social, maybe 2010, 2011. I think it was, it, was, uh, it was a Christmas theme in March, wasn't it? Something terrible like that. Anyway, it was fancy yeah. dress. And I remember Peter Horn and um, Chris Fizarro spent about a week to 10 days making sheep costumes because they're from Fife. They're from the kingdom of Fife. So they obviously love their animals on the East Coast no, of Scotland. No, it wasn't because that. It was because it was a Christmas social. So there was a shep and three sheep. Because <laughs> yeah. I was dressed as a Christmas present. We Our, our Christmas social got cancelled for some reason. So we were doing the Christmas social in March. So sorry to butt in. But yeah, the, Johnny, Johnny's forgot. <laughs> I can't that. remember. Oh, they're from Fife. They you must blocked be it out. reenacting farmers. I think that's why they chose the sheep. Let's be honest. Um, yeah. but that that is my lasting memory of Ryan so we had this team social um, Chris and Pete spent I think about a week with their girlfriends making these sheep costumes so like getting cotton wool hairspray sticking it all on making it nice um, and we're like what are they doing but I think Ryan was the only one that sort of caught wind of what they were doing and how much effort they put into it and also the fact it was flammable so we go into one of the bars the Estenda Glasgow um, and Ryan finds a candle and pretty much sets half the west end of Glasgow up a light. That is my lasting memory of Ryan in Glasgow. Oh, our fallout with Scottish rugby and trying to smooth that all, all over. Um, but that's a sort of typical what you can expect from a night out with Ryan. Good fun, hijinks, and um, naughty. Definitely. I remember Chris Fazar not having a clue what had happened because it went None up. Of us did. It went up pretty quick. The whole thing went up, it, mate. You lucky the, the street didn't go up. It was the first pub we got into as well, and <laughs> we just disappeared in flames. Ripped it off, but forgot that he'd put these shorts on and done the same to the shorts. So he had taken the top off thinking he was out of it. And we all looked down and we're like, he's still on fire. And his, he had these little shorts on with them on as well. So he's pulled them down. His willy's hanging out in the middle of the, in the pub. That was straight after I um I got buffaloed with a bottle of Listerine in your flat. Do you remember that? Yeah, someone buffaloed me taking a little swig out the Listerine bowl. So I had to down the Listerine bowl. That wasn't very nice. So what's a buffaloed? You're going to have to explain this to well, me. You know, now. you drink out your right hand. Right, okay. And you drink Christine, a come on. You know what buffaloed is. I'm a lady. Dude. No, what so I, and I've never lady. heard of it. I never, You're I've Irish. Never, yeah, I'm Irish, but I've never heard the term buffaloed. So what? So you yeah, have so to if drink? you drink out your right hand, it's buffalo and everyone's, and you got to down the pint. Okay. Never heard that? And oh, no, I have, yeah, yeah. But yeah, just... so I've obviously taken a sip of Listerine in Johnny's flat. I'm pretty sure it's... Oh, no, you used to rent the flat to the boys, so you were obviously panicking. And, yeah, took a little sip of Listerine, and then someone shouted, Buffalo! So that was when I, yeah, had to down the bottle of Listerine before that. That's yeah. probably which... That sent me on my way. It was think, Listerine Johnny. that did it. That's right, man. Yeah. It was Listerine. Well, look, Johnny, we won't keep you any longer. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. It was a very short and sweet interview, but, um, yeah, thanks for coming on. Pleasure. Thanks for having us, guys. Well, the Six Nations isn't the only big topic to discuss this week as we continue to hear rumours about whether or not the Lions tour will go ahead. So apparently the four home nations captains were on a conference call this week with the senior management pushing for the tour to go ahead. So I suppose we'll just have to wait and see how that plays out. But on a more positive note, there's also been rumours building over the last two weeks about a potential Lions 15 and a Sanzar 15. So that would compromise um, of the best players from the rugby championship. So, Jamie, first of all, do you think that it would work as a one-off series if the Lions tour wasn't going ahead? No. Uh, Why? I don't know. I, I, if there was going to be another team that is a collective as, as countries, I'd like to see a Pacific Islands side come together. Um, I think the Australia, New Zealand and um, South Africa so far apart geographically and as identities as rugby countries. I think a team comprising those countries doesn't work for me. Um, the Lions is what it is because they're, they're part of the United Kingdom. Um, as such, I say Ireland, Ireland isn't, mm. but it's British and Irish Lions concept. I'd like to see the Pacific Islands have something um, where they come together and have a touring team like the Lions. 
Sansa, no, I don't like the idea. If you had to put a team together, who would, you know, who would make your team? So Ryan, I'll start with you. Start with Jamie. I was going to give Jamie a minute to calm down. Okay, so. start with me. Um, I would basically pick the whole of the New Zealand team. <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. And then I would chuck in maybe Cheslin Colby, uh, Khaleesi, I'd have him in there. And maybe some giant second row who, I mean, Et, Etzbeth, what's the other one? The one that looks like Hagrid? That yeah, plays yeah. for South Africa? Like just a massive mutant second row because Kiwis don't really have giant second rows, do they? So, yeah, just one of those big boys from South Africa, whoever they are. That would be that'd pretty much be my team. And then get Renz to coach it. Dave Rennie, Australia coach, and there's a coach them. Done. What about you, Jamie? Who would make your I mean, team? It's hard, to, it's hard to disagree with... Um... Something you agree oh, the on. The Springbok pack, I'd have kits off. I would have Khaleesi, Steph de Toit, and probably, you know, those three in amongst a predominantly all black pack. Um, yeah, maybe one of the second rows as well. It needs the, it needs the muscle of the South African pack. Um, and then, yeah, backs. Colby's got to be in there. Blokes, an immense player. Yeah. Um, Kiwi halfbacks. Maybe a few of the Aussies sprinkled in there, but a mix in the back line, I think. I think across those three countries have some special, special backs. So, I mean, it'll be a freakish side. There's no doubt about that. But whether we'll ever see it happen, God knows. Well, we just have to start thinking of things, don't we? We just have to get creative this year. Well, I'd actually love for our listeners to get involved with this and to send us our, their, their version of a starting 15. But actually, we're also going to run a competition. So I'm not sure if our listeners know this, but we actually have some pretty cool Rugby Pass merchandise available. So how about we put it to our listeners to give it their best shot at designing a concept sans our kit that inc- or incorporates all the country's values. And they have to post their entry on Twitter with the hashtag offload kit and the best one will get some Rugby Pass merch. That's a fabulous idea. So wonderful. I love how I just came up with it on the spot. I know, incredible. It's just so great. James Botham obviously never heard the expression two ears, one mouth before because um, he spoke over Alan Wynne Jones at a training session back in autumn. Jamie, have you ever experienced the Alan Wynne death stare before? Uh, I don't think so. Not too often. Um, I can see where James is coming from with that comment. You know, he's a... Confident lad, you know, backs his ability. I love that. I love that about younger players who come in. Um, but I guess there's a time and a place <laughs> for skippers talking. Uh, that exuberance of youth sometimes gets the better of you. Uh, I've probably been that kid um, when I was younger and probably annoyed people no end with the amount I wanted to speak. Um, but there's a time and a place. And you learn. You know, learn obviously he's come out and spoken about that. You know, that happens in lots of environments across the country quite often um, and that, that go unspoken about. Uh, but you learn, you learn when to, when to speak. But I, look, I love young, young players coming into the game um, and having opinions and bringing energy or whatever. But I think you, you slowly learn your place as a young player. Um, sorry, you quickly learn your place as a young player, you know, when, when to open your mouth and when to just listen. Um, and I guess, you know, when the, when, the big man, when the big man is talking, he's someone you don't cut across. Yeah, I'd say you'd want to die. I'd say you'd want the world to swallow you up now. Um, Because obviously just wasn't listening. But Ryan, do you have any stories of young players that you've seen come into squads and make comments or do something that they very quickly regretted? Um, I mean, you always get these guys that come in and think they've cracked it already. And they're the ones that drive me mad, though. They come in and they think... Right, well, you know, I, I, I'm still of the probably more old school mindset. You've got to earn your stripes when you come into a squad and you sort of, you know, do what you're told for the first couple of years. And and it's the ones that push back a little bit, and, you know, they probably get it a bit more, you know, get a bit more stiff from, from the uh, older players. But no, I don't think there's anything too bad from what I've known throughout the past. I mean, a couple of times there was one player... Um, when Sean Lamont told him to take, you know, you do these photo shoots at the beginning of the season and Sean Lamont said, uh, go and chuck that kit upstairs for the kit man. And he said, I'm not doing it. And this is Sean Lamont, 100 odd caps for Scotland. And everyone's just gone, hold on a minute, what's just happened? And you're like, oh shit, this isn't good. So Sean Lamont being the uh, the expert as he is, he just went, right, okay, then picked up all the kit himself put it all into the bin, took it all up. This man that played 100 caps for Scotland 
and said absolutely nothing about it, put it away. And it wasn't until the end of the season at the court session that it came back out. And that, that yeah, that player got his uh, come up and so certainly. So that was that's how a, that's how a senior player should lead. So that was, um, that was probably the rugby. One rugby that's a great story. Like rugby has a way of uh, of way of keeping him in place. Yeah. Uh, um, it has a brilliant way of keeping you in place. And yeah, court sessions are the perfect, perfect way to do that. It's such a shame. I haven't had a court session. It, what feels like eternity. Tell me about it. But it's just, you know, the way that Sean Lamont just, n- not a word was said, just picked it up and you, everyone knew, oh shit. And he, I think even the guy that had done it was like, oh, I should have taken that up. And you could tell. So it took a whole season to get him back. But yeah, he was, he was definitely uh, shamed for it. I'll say that. Did you hear what Eddie Jones came out with this week? So he said that he was embarrassed to be at the same table as the genius Sir David Brailsford, who transformed the British cycling team into the most successful in the world through his philosophical and psychological sporting theories. So I want to know what are the weirdest encounters you've had with specialist coaches or psychologists who've maybe been brought into camp to help the, the team reach their true potential? I mean... I say weird psychologists uh, and performance coaches. I mean, one of the most amazing talks we were given, it was at a time, it was probably around 2011, 2012, maybe 2013. And I remember looking at England, social media was was kind of taking off and Twitter and all this. And England had, a, had got a few people in for um, to give them motivational talks. Uh, and I remember Gary Neville, had, I think he'd recently finished with England, um, or as a player with Man United, and he, he, he had gone into the England camp for a few days and had given them big talks and Q&As and whatever. And um, I remember we sat as a, as a senior group with um, the team manager around, OK, who's Welsh that we can get in, you know, as a squad for doing the campaign? Who can we get in who's, you know, uh, maybe high performance um, or another sports person we can learn something off? And the team manager, <laughs> team manager Alan Phillips, um, who's now the team manager of the Lions, was like, well, lads, leave it with me. And so a few weeks later, it's one Tuesday afternoon, um, post sorry, Tuesday evening, and we're all staying at the Vale Hotel. And Alan Phillips comes and introduces Howard Marks. Now, I don't know if you know who Howard Marks Howard Marks yeah, is Mr. Nice. So the film Mr. Nice, the famous book how Mr. Nice is based on basically he was the CIA's most wanted man at one point during Truck the runner. um yeah, he was the world's most notorious ganja dealer. Um, he if you need, didn't he? No, he was at Oxford. <laughs> so he went to Oxford. Oh, that that yeah, picked up his, I mean, if anyone hasn't seen the film Mr. Nice, Reese Evans plays him. Um a wonderful book as well. Great, great story. Anyway, Howard Marks came to give us a talk. Nothing to do with sport. I mean, the lad, the lad, the bloke probably liked his rugby, um, but it was fascinating, absolutely oh, yeah. fascinating. You know, uh, this guy who's, as I said, CIA's most wanted, the world's biggest kind of drug dealer at the time. Um, I just thought it was amazing. It was amazing. Obviously, at the time, we were like, lads, this cannot get out. You know, this <laughs> this didn't happen, <laughs> uh, sort of thing. But it's just, it just amazing. I remember after the talk as well, just going and leaving the hotel and, and he's he's just rolled up this massive kind of joint that he's smoking outside the hotel. Was it, am I right in saying he lived in an open prison in like Bolivia or somewhere, was it? I think so. Yeah. I mean, his story is unbelievable. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I've read that book. Yeah, it was unbelievable. That's so cool. I would have loved that. Yeah, it was, it was awesome. But I, I just loved it. I loved it how, you know... Nothing getting all it. these performance people in the bottom of the well. Should we yeah. got Mr. Nice in? That is wicked. I don't know why Greg Townsend got this bloke into and it is a big, big cat man. And he came in and spoke about big cats one and it just turned into an absolute joke. The boys were just dying like this guy's trying his best up the front. And everyone was like, What is going on? He was telling us about big cats and it, it was just about how they hunt prey and all this stuff. And by the end of it, the boys were just giggling like little girls in the back of the room. And, Turned into an absolute like Joe, Joe Exotic, like yeah, pretty much, pretty much the big cat man. We were like, right, that didn't work. Funnily <laughs> enough, you're talking about cat. big cats. When I played at Racing, um, my second season there, pre season, um, like all teams want to do something pre season, then they kind of set the tone for the year. So, all I remember is Jackie Lorenzetti, the president, had, 
to come to the club in the morning. He wasn't at the club every day, but kind of every other day he was there. And he'd be like, right, lads, um, team meeting. We're going to go out to the out to the um, kind of big tent at the back. And so we're all queuing up outside this big tent. And Jackie's taking pride of place um, at the front of the front of the tent. And <laughs> this is so weird. He was letting in players one by one. And as he's letting all the players in one by one, he's like, he's got his teeth out and he's like, show your teeth, show your teeth like this. And he's letting the players in one by one. And I'm just thinking, what on earth is going on in here? And, and I, I went into the tent and there were two caged lions and tigers. Um, what are they? What's the striped ones? Tigers. Two yeah. Caged tigers in, you know, in literally the back end of Paris in a tent at the back of our, our rugby training ground. Why? Because he wanted us to be like tigers that year. <laughs> oh my. I kid you not. He was like, this is the animal. They are, you know, they are ruthless. They go for their prey. They go for the jugular sort oh of thing. My. And then they made us, well, I said they made us, they led us into this tent to appreciate the tiger. And what were you like? You weren't put in there or anything with them. You just sort of looked at them. Oh, no, we right, just okay, admire them. And then they fed them. They gave them some food, and we got to watch the meeting and stuff. Oh, no, like it was pretty incredible. Who but, thinks? Who, but who thinks that's going to inspire the team? Who who sits there and goes, "Fuck, oh, fucking good idea." Good idea. I'm going to get the tigers ready. Right right. so, yeah. you know, see, we've always talked about the wild dogs. So who would have to, the most efficient hunting animal out there? The wild dog. So sorry about that, guys. My laptop completely died. Um, I think there's a full moon on Thursday, so potentially that's why I'm having technical issues. Right, well, we'll move on to our social 15. So we're now going to fill another position for our tourist 15, who are quickly becoming one of the most social sides ever created in um, the history of sport. So today we're looking to fill the much coveted 15 jersey. So Jamie and Ryan, who are you putting forwards for this shirt? Well... I've had a good think about 15 is quite a difficult one. Um, there's some guys I think you'll know, Jamie, that you've played with who will probably be up there. I'd like to see what old Sanjay was like, Liam Williams uh, on the piss. But for me, um, a man called Peter Murchie who played 15 at Glasgow for us. He's got a couple of Scotland caps maybe under his belt. Um, but you need that man on the tour that can give the ship as as well as anything, take it. And this man has taken a lot of flack. Um, on a night out, Pete Murchie can quickly turn from a, a very normal, civilised human being to a junkie in all of 10 seconds by taking his front teeth out. We know a lot of players, though, Jamie, that have their teeth knocked out in this game. And Murchie is one of them. And the amount of times you see him from across the room, just take the teeth out straight into a pint glass and someone's there sipping away like what the hell is that at the bottom of a pint and there's Murchie smiling with no teeth in um we used to have a dildo which came on tour with us <laughs> everywhere and what would happen is this dildo would get a bottle strapped to it it was the team dildo and you'd strap a water bottle to it and any away trip with Glasgow you would put it in someone's bag that didn't know about it so new guys young guys anyone that had no idea about this dildo, you knew as soon as you were coming through security and everyone stood at the other side, you put your bag through, everyone stood there, you go, what, what is, what's everyone doing? You know something's up straight away. Well, Pete Murchie decided to put it in the chief exec's hand luggage bag. Brilliant. <laughs> and he slips this massive dildo with the bottle, gets in his bag before we get off the coach at the airport. We were all stood at the other side waiting and yeah, sure enough, comes through. The woman pulls this filled out the chief exec's bag. The, the, the funniest thing of it all, it did not see the funny side of it. All the boys are cr like cracking up, comes on the plane and someone's dobbed him in and he's taking this dildo, throwing it across the plane at him. And we're oh, you think that's funny, dear? The next week, Pete Murchie got like sent up to the Shetlands or something on a player appearance, like eight hours away. Um, so like, he, he's someone is world class. Oh <laughs> someone, this, this dildo was, yeah, it was one of the funniest things. I think it's had to be pulled back a bit because there was a few looks you used to get, but yeah, you didn't want to get done with that. And another story, Murchie's paying for the for the taxi on this stag do. I can't remember whose it was, Pete Horn stag do maybe. And we're getting out the taxi. I said, Murch, don't worry, I've got your bag, mate. I've got your bag. 
as he's paying the taxi, open the boot of the taxi. And there is a five litre jerry can of engine oil in there. <laughs> Slipped into his hand luggage. I've got your bag, mate. Take it through. Give it to him. So hand him it. Just as we get to the uh, security, puts his hand luggage through with a five litre can of engine oil in it. <laughs> this was a few years back as well. I'd had a few beers before we got on the plane and oh my, you should have seen his face as he was getting off, but he was someone that could always take it as well as give it. So he's another person I would uh, I'd definitely have on that tour with us when we go. I, I mean, I can't top that with anyone I've played with. That's, this, this guy sounds like a legend. No, Ryan, you have a new segment this week, which, which, this week, which you have been greatly looking forward to where you can read out some of your favorite comments from our past youtube videos so tell me what has caught your eye this week good or bad well i had a little look because we've not done this yet i went and found some of the worst um some of the you know the really horrible ones <laughs> is this like mean tweets now oh yeah. yeah yeah i don't think we should really be doing too much of this because it will give them what they want but Stove Boy has written as a Scottish. Oh, are we rug- going to do the names? Are we? Is that what oh, we're doing? I'm throwing it out there. I'm, I'm getting Stove Boy involved. It's on a public forum, right? So crack on. Stove right. Boy is uh, that's not his real name either because he's private. That's Oliver. I had a little look, tried to get on there. <laughs> Obviously, as a Scottish rugby fan, I'm just so embarrassed of him talking about me. Obviously, he's a Poundland Jim Hamilton. That's no reflection on Jim, who could at least play rugby. <laughs> Genius. I mean, what a line. What's even oh, better? What is even better is that then Mega Haitian or something has bowed in and put Jim could play with a laughing emoji. And he said, What's your point? This person has then continued to slag Jim Hamilton off. So Jim's getting roped into this as well. Sorry, Jim. But penalty machine and no dynamism around the park when Scotland desperately needed it. That has other teams were getting quicker and more explosive. He even admits it himself. And then this bloke, they, they have a full-on conversation just slagging me and Jim off. So unbelievable. Thank you very much uh, to that guy. Um, I got on to this bloke who comments quite a lot. So I'm guessing he could be someone that I know. You know, okay. you get with makeup. <laughs> this guy, um, there's quite a few of them from uh, him, but... If I had one question for Ryan Wilson, it would be in an alternative universe where you are good enough to play for England, would you still choose to play for Scotland? Yes, I would, Duat de Fuca. I would play for Scotland still. I know it's not as lucrative, but I would still play for Scotland. It's not all about the money. Um, And then the last one here, I'll give you one more. I'm not sure why people get so stuck into my accent. Like, what? My accent's my accent. I can't. Can't help it, can I? So this person, listen to this mug, proper Glaswegian accent on him as well, with the old, like, that face. Emoji. Well, I'm sorry, I, I don't understand. What, why do I have to have a Glaswegian accent? Can you explain that to me? So what's the comment, mate? No, it was just from the, it was from, you know, the England and Scotland thing. Yeah. From the Owen Farrell in the tunnel thing. This bloke just steamed in and said, listen to this my proper Glaswegian accent on him as well after I told the story. And then someone, someone's gone cringing hell. Who describes himself as ballsy? He's more well known for being a dick than playing rugby. How embarrassing that you've got, that your go-to story is that you once pushed George Ford. Perfect. I mean, it sums you up perfectly. Well, that is it from us. Thanks to Ryan Wilson, Jamie Roberts and Johnny Beatty. And thanks to you for listening. More offloading next week. Make sure to subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcast so you get it as soon as it's released. Leave us a rating and review if you can. And don't forget to check us out on YouTube as well. Thanks, guys.